Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as attendees start to trickle in, I will go ahead and get started um, with some opening remarks. Um, thank you for attending this webinar on ensuring housing resiliency in the face of climate change. My name is Alyssa Wooden and I'm a project coordinator at the National Environmental Health Association. Uh, today we have an excellent panel of speakers joining us who will be discussing how they are addressing this topic in their agencies and organizations. Uh, next slide, please. This webinar is hosted by the National Center for Healthy Housing and the National Environmental Health Association and is the third in a series on protecting homes during extreme weather. The first two webinars covered protecting homes during high wind events and promoting thermal control in homes. Recordings of those webinars can be found on the NCHH YouTube channel. Uh, NEHA and NCHH believe that healthy homes should be affordable and accessible to all and are dedicated to continuing to work together towards this goal. As the effects of climate change, including extreme heat, wildfires, and flooding grow more severe every year, more and more funding and outreach advocacy and collaboration will be needed to promote and provide weather resilient housing. With this webinar, we hope to give attendees some resources and information that you can use to mitigate the effects of climate change on homes in your own communities. Um, I would like to thank the CDC for providing funding for this webinar series and our moderator and speakers for joining us today. Next slide, please. Uh, and before we begin, uh, we encourage attendees to ask questions by typing them into the chat and our moderator will try to get to as many questions as possible within the time that we have. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Anna Planky from NCHH. Great, thank you, Alyssa. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide, please. So as Alyssa mentioned, my name is Anna. I am with the National Center for Healthy Housing. And before we jump into our panel discussion, I just want to talk a little bit more about this webinar series and about the project. So today is the third and final webinar on our series about protecting homes during extreme weather. The goal of this webinar series has been to share information about the impacts of extreme weather events on housing and on health. We also aim to highlight new resources, policies, and strategies to protect homes before, during, and after these events. Next slide. So here we have our funding acknowledgement, again, just highlighting the partnership and collaboration that Alyssa was talking about in the intro, and then of course the content disclaimer. Next slide. So not only is this webinar series a collaboration, but this whole project has been a collaboration between NCHH, NEHA, and CDC. During this project, our goal has been to compile and share um, and also create new resources on climate change and the populations um, and communities that are most affected by a changing climate. Um, so these resources have been on extreme weather events and also how they are particularly relevant to healthy homes. Um, again, we just wanna highlight um, and make sure that we focus on environmental justice health equity, and again, on those populations and communities that have been most affected by a changing climate. Lastly, our goal has been to identify needs where public health and healthy housing professionals can assist and or bridge gaps through creating these resources or facilitating connections or just amplifying and disseminating information that already exists. Next slide. Um, next, I just want to point to some new and upcoming resources from NCHH that are a product of this partnership and of this project. Uh, we have published resource libraries on hurricanes and high wind events, extreme heat and extreme cold. These resource libraries are intended for residents and provide guidance on how to stay safe and healthy before, during and after these extreme weather events. Um, and as always, we're approaching these topics with a healthy housing lens. Next slide. Um, next, you can find the recordings of our past two webinars that Alyssa was speaking about in the intro um, about um, the protecting homes during um, extreme weather events on the high wind events and also on thermal control. Um, those are the past two webinars in this series and those YouTube or um, bit.ly links are there on your screen. Next slide. So in addition to our past webinars and those resource libraries, we've also been developing five companion resources on these various topics. These include a spotlight of flood assistance programs around the country that include information like funding, the impact and lessons learned. 
We also have been developing a resource that compares green building codes to sections of the National Safe and Healthy Housing Standard that are relevant to thermal comfort. Next, we're developing two home maintenance checklists that are relevant to extreme heat and extreme cold. So residents um, know what maintenance actions they should and can be taking throughout the year leading up to those two seasons. And lastly, we're finalizing a brief on the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program or LIHE program that includes information on the program structure, um, opportunities to address thermal comfort and successes an example of the program and providing cool, cooling benefits to residents. So be on the lookout for those um, upcoming resources in the next month. Next slide. Great, so next I just wanna talk a little bit um, and provide a quick recap on some of the grounding context that we've discussed in our um, previous two webinars and get us all on the same page. So generally we need homes to be safe and healthy because we know Americans spend over 70% of their time inside the home. Additionally, Homes need to be a safe refuge to protect residents during extreme weather events. So for example, it's critical to have safe indoor air quality during wildfires and significant smoke events. We also know that other kinds of disasters like flooding as a result of hurricanes and other um, severe storms can exacerbate unhealthy conditions or they can destroy homes entirely and leave people without a safe place to live. Next slide. Lastly, um, I just wanna make a couple of distinctions here between mitigation and adaptation. So climate mitigation refers to efforts to reduce or slow the causes of climate change. Um, a healthy housing example of this is making homes more energy efficient, reducing energy usage and needs. Um, climate adaptation refers to efforts to improve our ability to withstand current effects of climate change. Um, so a healthy housing example of this might be providing retrofits to home to better withstand extreme weather events and protect resident health. Throughout this webinar series, um, we've been primarily focused on adaptation, but we wanna note that both approaches are necessary and are interconnected. Next slide. So with that, um, it's my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Natasha DeJarnet, who will be moderating for us today. Dr. Natasha DeJarnet is an assistant professor in the Christina Lee Brown Environment Institute at the University of Louisville, Division of Environmental Medicine. She's researching the health impacts of extreme heat exposure and environmental health disparities. In addition, she is a professorial lecturer in the environmental and occupational health at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health. Previously, Dr. DeJarnet was Interim Associate Director of Program and Partnership Development at the National Environmental Health Association, leading research, climate and health, and children's environmental health. She also previously served as a policy analyst at the American Public Health Association, or APHA, where she led the national environment portfolio, including air and water exposures, along with climate change. Dr. Dijarna is a member of EPA's Children's Health Protection Advisory Committee, is chair of the governing board of Citizens Climate Education, a president-elect of the board of directors of Physicians for Social Responsibility, chair-elect for APHA's Environment Section, member of the advisory board of APHA's Center for Climate, Health and Equity, a member of the board of trustees for the BTS Center, Special Advisor to the Environmental Health and Equity Collaborative and a steering committee member of the International Transformational Resilience Coalition. So with that, I will now turn it over to you, Natasha, to introduce, to introduce our panelists and to get us started. So go ahead. Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction, Anna, and thank you to the National Environmental Health Association and the National Center for Healthy Housing for hosting this much needed and incredibly timely webinar series on protecting homes during extreme weather. I am honored to moderate today's discussion. And without further ado, I am pleased to introduce you to today's speakers. Uh, next slide, please. So first, I'll introduce Mark Couder. As an employee of the City of Austin Office of Sustainability, Mark works with city departments to embed climate adaptation strategies into long-term operation and asset management planning. 
In this role as environmental program manager, he supports community organizers to increase climate adaptation in the Eastern Crescent. Mark received a certificate in climate change and health from the Yale School of Public Health, a Master of Public Health, uh, I'm sorry, a Master of Science and Sustainable Design from the University of Texas at Austin School of Architecture, a Bachelor, a Bachelor of Science in Urban Planning from Arizona State University Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts, and he is a member of the National Association of County and City Health Officials Global Climate Change Work Group. And next slide, please. I'll now introduce Dr. Jillian Middlestadt. Uh, so Dr. Middlestadt is an air quality and environmental health professional who focuses on safe and equitable indoor environments. She currently leads the Tribal Healthy Homes Network addressing tribal exposure to indoor air hazards through research, training, and culturally tailored interventions. Dr. Middlestadt, also directs the Partnership for Air Matters, a nonprofit that provides indoor air educational toolkits on, to environmental justice communities. She recently co-chaired EPA's Clean Air Act 50th Anniversary Report and was appointed to a National Academies of Science work group on indoor air chemistry. She previously chaired the Washington State Asthma Initiative and the Washington Leadership Council for the American Lung Association. She is currently co-chair of the National Safe and Healthy Housing Coalition. And next slide. And our final panelist is Michael Pasquila. Michael was appointed as the CEO and director for the East Shore District Health Department in 2010. Michael holds a BS degree in public health and nutrition from Southern Connecticut University and a master's degree in public health from University of Connecticut. He is a registered sanitarian and has over 30 years of experience as a public health official. He is a PhD candidate at Queen Margaret University. In addition, Michael is an adjunct professor at the Connecticut, at Southern Connecticut State University and a lecturer at Yale University in the School of Public Health located in New Haven, Connecticut. Michael resides in the town of Guilford, Connecticut with his wife and two sons. So thank you all for joining this conversation today. Um, we, we have a, a great slate of questions uh, to, to navigate through this discussion and we encourage the audience to enter questions through the chat at any point. We will have audience Q&A uh, later on uh, during our panel. But to kick off this discussion, um, please, I'd love to hear from each panelist a short summary about the work that you're doing to improve housing or infrastructure resiliency in the face of climate change and extreme weather. So how about if we start with Mark and then Gillian and then Michael? Well, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, located deep in the heart of Texas, Austin experiences a lot of the same shocks and stressors everybody else experiences with increase in heat, drought, and flooding. But we also have increases in wildfire, grass fires, and we are not prepared for cold weather. So when we have a cold spell, we get a lot of damage. So my role at the city of Austin is to work with city departments, our utilities, our health centers, our rec centers, our roads, our bridges, everything, to see how vulnerable it is to all these events. Uh, we've done a lot of work on that, put out a lot of plans, and have a lot of efforts going forward. One thing we haven't done very well is figuring out what community vulnerability means. So in the past couple of years, right before COVID, we started to reach out to community members to see how they're impacted by heat, drought, flood, wildfire, cold spells, wind, the list gets longer. And it's really sort of focusing on what that lived experience is and how does that start to inform what decisions we make going forward. So most of my time is spent meeting with people, writing emails, having meetings and listening and trying to figure out how to make it all happen. All right, audio check, can you hear me? Excellent. Um, yeah, I'll follow up to what Mark was saying is one dimension of our work 
most recently is trying to assess vulnerability. Um, basically, I'm the director of the Tribal Healthy Homes Network in where EPA funded, we're housed within the Tulalip Tribes, which is in Western Washington. Um, we periodically have other funding, but we exist largely because the American Indian Alaska Native communities live in some of the most substandard housing, as you can imagine, low on the energy ladder. Um, and that the types of risks they experience in their house relating to heating, cooling, ventilation, filtration, overcrowding, moisture damage, those risks have all been uh, accelerated tremendously, of course, by climate events, especially uh, when I hear and talk with my colleagues in Alaska who are really on the forefront of some of those adverse impacts. Um, so we do outreach education training. Um, and then briefly, I'll say the Partnership for Air Matters that was mentioned was created about eight years ago. And the premise behind that, I think, is even more important right now, given the climate events. And we work to really inform and engage and empower residents to address those indoor air hazards that I like to say are within their locus of control. It's not a substitute for in-home assessments and mitigation, but we also need residents to be able to become advocates and recognize when the risks um, may not be observed, smelled, even measurable at certain times, um, but are you know um, posing risks. So we do toolkits. We've distributed over 3,000 nationwide to residents, mostly in tribal, but also rural, cold climate, low-income communities. Um, and uh, we'll go into that a bit, little bit later, but really our goal is to have awareness and empowerment um, so that we're having a dialogue, not just risk communication as a one-way channel, particularly now when we need to understand vulnerability. So thank you. Okay, it's, uh, it's my turn. Hi, Michael Pascasilla. I'm, uh, I'm in Connecticut, the East Shore District Health Department. And so uh, as a local health department, we have two hats. So we have our mandate hat, where we have some mandates that we have to, to meet um, through the Connecticut General Statutes and the Public Health Code. And then we have our education hat as a public health department. Um, we also run the Medical Reserve Corps. Uh, for New Haven County. Um, so we have a, a group of volunteers that help us do some work when it comes to um, major events. Um, you know, lately we, we've been having lots of major events like we're seeing across the country, across the globe. Um, for instance, right now, uh, we're getting a little, uh, Mark, we're getting a little Texas weather right now in, in Connecticut. And, um, and that's the thing that we're, we're trying to um, educate our community um, about climate change. Um, we do sheltering in place um, and, and, and going on what uh, Jillian said is empowering our community. Government has a role um, and we're gonna do our role. We're gonna help with vulnerable populations, the seniors working with our schools, but residents, the average person out there also has a role and we try to empower them. So when a hurricane comes, we can't be everywhere um, all at once. We certainly can't respond in the middle of a hurricane because that's not safe. Um, and so we're doing a lot of uh, proactive work um, to understand one, where the vulnerable community is hands down. That's one of our number one priorities. And where we can, we're encouraging condominium associations um, in neighborhoods to work together and have their back right, when something happens. Uh, so uh, lots happening and, and we're gonna talk about some of the things we do with flooding and mold and mildew and septic systems and wells and all that stuff. Um, so I'm looking forward uh, to, uh, to the next hour or so. Um, and I wanna thank Miha and the National Center for Healthy Housing for this opportunity. Oh, great. Thank you all for sharing these summaries and uh, what you share is so foundational to what we're discussing today. It's very interesting to hear about the work that's taking place to assess and identify, diagnose uh, vulnerabilities uh, in each of your communities, and then also what that entails. Um, I, and I like how Mark kicked off this conversation with, with saying this is a lot of listening.
It's a lot of listening to communities to um, engage, empower, and build resilience in communities. So I, I can't hear, I can't wait to hear what more you will share around these topics. Um, but I'll move us to another question. Um, it's critical that we shift from primarily responding to disasters to building the resilient infrastructure needed to protect people during disasters, including retrofitting, retrofitting existing housing. So what are some promising, inspiring models, examples, or opportunities that you see in this space? How about if we start with Jillian and then Michael and then Mark? Sure. Um, I reflected on this question, and what struck me in particular is that while we want to look for evidence-based practices and interventions that can be scaled up rapidly, um, I also think we need to look at the public health response to COVID as an example of how to hyper-accelerate a response, and that it's clear evidence that across all agencies and strata of government, we can accelerate if we need to, if there's an imminent public health concern. Um, so I just want to preface that by saying we just have good evidence. It may have not have been done quite well, but it was done. Um, so in terms of specific examples, there's just two that I'll offer. One is, uh, it was referenced earlier, I believe, by Anna, which is the LIHEAP program, right? It already has the congressional funding. It has an agency. You can do funding for repair, replacement of heating and cooling systems. So to me, that's a mechanism that exists. The infrastructure is there. States already have the flexibility of modifying the eligibility of how funds can be used. So to me, there's a channel that exists that could be used rapidly, um, essentially with in just increasing the funding and possibly changing the use. The second is my most, I think, pronounced uh, underutilized, which is that Medicaid and Medicare, as you may know, pay for durable medical goods. If you just Google that list, you'll see that they pay for CPAP machines, patient lifts, hospital beds, walkers, oxygen tanks. Um, for a long time, I've advocated that um, air filtration in your home or air exchange should be a durable medical good and that physicians should have the ability to prescribe it and have it paid for um, so that anyone who meets susceptibility criteria clinically um, is approved just as they would for a vaccine or a booster and that pharmacies can help with that campaign to ensure that patients ask their provider and are aware that that. So those are, those are my two that I can think of. I'm sure there's many more, so. Okay, so um, at the local health department level, so as a local public health department, um, you know, these are our residents um, and we work collaboratively with not just town officials, with businesses, uh, with our residents, um, with condominium associations, senior centers. Um, and so everybody, we, we partner with everybody that we can um, to move this issue forward. Um, first, let's talk a little bit about enforcement. Um, it's something that we don't like to do, uh, but over the last uh, decade, we're really seeing significant damage on our coast. Um, so the area we serve on the Connecticut coastline, we've had houses fall in water, we've had uh, uh, tornadoes, we've had tidal surges. And so from a building department standpoint, we're working with our building department. Um, and so when a house is built, or when there's modifications, we have new building standard codes, right? To make them safer and be proactive instead of reactive. Um, so for instance, if someone has a house where they want to level a house and put a new house up, it has to be elevated. Um, we look at um, the water supply system because on the coast we're seeing um, salt water intrusion in some of our wells. Uh, septic systems at one time where they're replaced may have been okay 50 years ago, but now the, the groundwater is rising. And so those septic systems are flooding more. Um, and so we're looking at it from an environmental health standpoint, from a building health standpoint. And when we can, we, we implement practical environmental health laws to be proactive during reactive. And that's really a good model to use um, not to say everybody has to raise their houses, that's not going to work. Um, but when they are in the middle of a project or coming for a permit, that is when we handle it. So that's the, the enforcement side of the house. Um, most of our work done, is done um, 
through education. Um, and as a health department, we are a resource, a, a convener of different partners to try to get this issue moving forward. So um, we are working on, I'll just name one project, it's a photojournalism um, climate change piece where we're getting stories from our community and they're telling their stories, whether it's on camera, they're writing them, they're giving us pictures, however, and however they feel comfortable. And then we're sharing those stories with the community members. And what that's doing is it's one, providing uh, a conversation. And two, we're finding people are having the aha moment where it's like, wait a second, that's happening to me too. Or I remember that storm or this happened to me. Um, and not government saying, okay, folks, it's climate change, we all have, it. it's, a, it's a different approach um, because government is not going to solve this. We are certainly um, at all levels going to move this forward. But in the end, it's gonna be the average consumer making changes. And some of those little changes are gonna to add to bigger changes. Um, we're doing things like, uh, like everyone else uh, trying to promote electric cars, um, biking, walking to work. We're looking at putting different paths, um, sidewalk improvements, subdivisions that are being built now, now require a sidewalk, right? Um, and we try to connect the sidewalks or at least have a long-term plan um, so communities are more walkable. Um, and we're doing that on the edu education side of the house. So there's a lot, a lot happening in that realm. And, um, you know, I, I've heard this before, and I, I truly believe that you, you get more bees with honey, right? We need to do it not through enforcement. There is a place and a time for that. But most people, I find if you educate them, if you give them the tools, um, they want to do the right thing. Uh, but we just need to structure it a, a bit. And we need more bees, for sure. Uh, I'm really inspired by Jillian and Michael's responses, and I hope, uh, I would love to say I have a lot more. Um, I'll tell you one project that I'm excited about right now is, similar to Michael, it's trying to figure out how to get the community members to actually collect and communicate the data in their community. And one example is we went after a NOAA CAPA grant, which is, you know, we would we funded community members to drive around their neighborhood with sensors that tracked heat and humidity at particular days, particular times in a day. And they drove around and at the end of the, the project, they were able to see all the data they created and able to sort of understand the data in their community and why that is. So we're trying to figure out how to get more of that sort of lived experience and data connected. And um, by building these relationships, now they're more excited to do the next project. And we've gotten this group of maybe 30 or 40 community members in East Austin to sort of come together and think about what's the next big thing. So the discussion there is leading to, you know, do we hand out those Nest thermostats so we can start to track how people are using power? And then we could immediately see, you know, you need more insulation or you need this or that. So trying to connect quicker responses based on data that community connects, can actually collects. And that to us is really, really exciting. The last piece is we actually got a call from Google. Google is able to track what people are researching at any point at any time. I don't know if you know that, but that's kind of scary, but it's also potentially uh, exciting because then we can see a certain neighborhood, a lot of people are looking for fans or a lot of people are looking for cooling centers or whatever. And then we can start to say, you know what, this community is really looking for this. Let's just go out there, go to door to door and see if, if we can help them out. So trying to connect technology to people as quickly as possible. That is absolutely fascinating to be able to pinpoint that by neighborhood and to be able to utilize that information to help build community resilience. That's quite interesting. Everything our speakers have said um, has, has been uh, very eye-opening. I, I love these themes of taking lessons learned from current experiences like COVID and being able to apply that towards resilience and certainly charming more bees with honey um, and all the innovative ways that we're able to incorporate uh, resilience building in our communities with honey <laughs> rather than, um, rather than 
adverse ways, I'll say, for lack of a better word. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I'll move us on to, to another question to continue moving our conversation forward. I'm sure any of these questions we could spend um, the rest of the day on, but uh, I look forward uh, for more opportunities for you to share your insights with the audience here. So I'll, I'll move us on to the next question. What are some best practices or models from other healthy housing topics that could be instructive here? So how about if we start with Michael this time, then Mark, then Jillian. Okay, um, so um, with, with better housing, um, there's a, a, a few things that we're working on. Um, and, and, and it's not a mandate. Um, in some communities, I think it may be a mandate, but in our community, it's not. We're getting people to think, um, uh, we'll take asthma, right? So our asthma rates are increasing. Um, and what can we do? And so when houses are built um, or when HVAC systems are modified um, to get a better, um, HEPA-like filters on the new systems. Um, so that's one of the things that we're, we're trying to do as far as best practices is improve um, some of the air quality inside um, because you know, what we're finding is that indoor air pollution is a major problem. Um, one of the other things that uh, we're doing is we're, you know, obviously we're testing for radon. That's another indoor air pollutant. And, and here in Connecticut, we certainly have our share. Um, and working with our building department. Um, and, and I think that's probably one of the biggest strides that we, we have made is while we're involved when septics and wells are put in, the actual structure of the house, um, we're not really involved in. And that's really a building department. Um, and so working with building, working with planning, um, getting them to think about best practices, um, while we've talked about mandates, uh, that's a little tough because when you have a subdivision and you start putting any kind of mandates, you know, you'll get pushback uh, because it costs money, right? Because there's obviously a bottom line for the builders and the developers. Uh, but anyway, we could recommend, hey, have you thought about this? Can you do that? And not everyone um, sort of bites at the apple, but we have had some success um, and it gets the building department, the fire department, uh, zoning, planning, to start thinking about you know, best practices, looking at impermeable soil uh, um, surfaces um, where we're not paving everything. Um, solar, that's something that we're really pushing here and our, our communities have applied to get some um, solar power at a discounted rate. Um, and so it can be retrofitted um, for existing houses and in new homes, we're trying to, you know, get them to th think about it. Um, again, it's a volunteer program. It's, uh, it's I, I wish more people would sign up, um, but it's, this, it's a step in the right direction to get our partners to think how they can be part of this. Um, and it's, it's you know, overall, it's been pretty successful. So that's one of the things that we're doing is getting our partners who are actually working with the developers. And we've actually had some developers um, not only embrace it, but put it in the design of other subdivisions and other communities, which is pre pretty cool to see um, because it's, you know, it's like, wish, wish it was in my community a bit more, but hey, you know, it's the community next door. It's all good. We're one, one, uh, one happy state, planet, nation. So those are some of the things that we're doing. It's, uh, it's interesting to see how different your landscape is to mine, right? Because in Austin, we are very a suburban sort of makeup, but we don't have basements. So we don't worry about radon. We're either slab on grade or pier and beam. A lot of the older structures are not designed for this climate. I'll give you an example is our house was built in 1954, zero insulation. So a lot of the old, these homes in low income areas, no insulation, single pane windows, not really great shape. They're places you can actually see through the, the walls. So they're not really designed for today. They're designed for Austin in the 1970s or 1950s. So that's becoming sort of a, a real issue because now as weather gets hotter or colder or worse, people have less ability to, uh, to sort of protect themselves. 
But the issue is, you know, we do have funding for weatherization. We have our own uh, energy company, Austin Energy, within the, the city government. We have a housing authority that does provide uh, in weatherization. But I think best practice is that we don't have the trust of the community, right? We have a long history of, of under investing in these communities. And when we show up with a badge or something, I think people are less than excited to talk to us. So best practice would be build that trust, have the people who have gone through the program, had a good experience, tell their neighbors and build that out. That takes time, that takes effort, and it's hard to see payback and it's hard to make the metric you know, to convince people that it's worth the time, but it is. It has, it has to happen and it has to go out there and talk to people one-on-one -on -one to make, you know, make sure they're safe. I'm just going to build on something briefly that Mark just said, and it's, it's, it's a little bit of a non sequitur here, but I think the, we have a small budget, so we do practice-based research, um, but the reason we do that is we want to understand the needs of the communities that we work in. And about five years ago, we did considerable amount of work around wood smoke, and more recently, it's been around wildfire smoke. But the specific questions we are asking in our research is, what messengers do you trust, and why or why not? So... Is it your local public health department? Is it an air quality agency? Is it EPA or CDC? Um, is it your neighbor or your auntie, right? Um, and then what we're trying to do is suggest that if you had an expanded network of communicators, if your physician discussed it with you, if your pharmacist gave you something whenever you were given your asthma medication refill, like who have we not used? Your WIC coordinator, your daycare provider, that we might be able to move that communication realm in so that as the classic, you know, people need to hear things seven times, seven ways, right, in order to embed it. So I just, I have to say, I think that's um, a really critical underpinning is how do we communicate in a way that we're building trust and then again, empowering folks. The specific answer um, about what best practices are models, the one thing I thought about here is, again, I work a little bit more on the air quality side of it, indoor air, and in our region, it's wildfire smoke and increasingly ozone intrusion from high heat and intrusion of wildfire smoke. So for us, what we're looking at is that the indoor outdoor concentrations of various pollutants um, vary considerably. The intrusion rates are a, a product of many factors, but in low income and substandard housing, um, you very often do not have an HVAC system. So you don't have air exchange, you know, every per ASHRAE guidelines, right? Um, and you absolutely may not have any kind of air cleaner. Um, and how, so A, you have an intervention necessary to provide improved air exchange and filtration, but the specific best practice, as you've seen, is the use of low-cost instruments, right? So people are now measuring CO2, PM, you can even measure VOCs, and those can be a good proxy for residents to say, as you see those numbers fluctuate, you can tell that it was cooking, it was keeping your doors closed or turning your fan off or on. That is an indication of whether or not you're getting adequate air exchange. A lot of academics that I follow on Twitter in the air quality field are using CO2 as a proxy for um, how vulnerable they are to infectious viral transmission. So they take their CO2 monitor on their plane, wherever they can, and if the number is high and there's not enough exchange, they consider that, that they're at greater risk of in infectious disease transmission. So I think low-cost sensors can, can, again, be an important uh, messaging tool. So it's all on that. Great, thank you all. Uh, you've raised uh, some really important best practices and each are specific to the communities and informed by the communities. I also like the emphasis around having partners um, where partners may bring other areas of expertise than we already have and can join in having shared goals towards moving uh, these resilience interventions forward. I also appreciate the, the thoughts around building trust in the community that cannot be undervalued. And it takes time. Um, and, and we need to know that going in, that, that it is a time investment, but well worth it. And I also like the points around trusted messengers and, and the importance there that this is something also that can be undervalued um, in some of our circles, um, but it, it absolutely carries great value in the end. Um, so thank you for these. Let's move ahead um, in our questions. So, oh, yes, please. Go yeah, ahead. Can I, can I, 
I think this is an important issue and um, both Mark and Jillian brought it up and that's trust. And we have to acknowledge something. After COVID um, and the fall from COVID, uh, public health in general um, is not really a trusted partner by the average person out there. And so, and when we talk about climate change and all the controversy around it, it's, it's, it, it just layers it up if, if, you, if you get my drift. And so we need to think how we're going to regain trust uh, moving forward um, and how we're going to work with um, our, our, all our stakeholders, our communities, town officials. Uh, and, and that's really, really important. It is the elephant in the room. And, um, you know, and, and I think we did a great job with what we had, um, but it, it just didn't fall. It, it didn't line up the way we expected. Um, and now we need to move forward, sort of lick our wounds and move forward. And it's really important that we regain trust because if we can't regain trust, we cannot move forward. And that is critical. It's all about relationships and partnering and collaborations. And that's how we work in public health. That's how we get things done. Um, enforcement has a role, last resort, not first approach. Anyway, I wanted just to get that out. I appreciate that. That really brought home the, the importance and the, the urgency around it. We, going into the pandemic, uh, there was already evidence of a lack of trust um, towards uh, the field of public health already. And then the pandemic really laid bare um, what we're experiencing in terms of trust. And, 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 and trust became a bit more fractured during this time. So it, it is of vital importance that we strategize and put plans into action on building trust. And I appreciate the expertise uh, that each of you have lended to the conversation on, on building trust as a best practice to build resilience in communities. Um, so, so important. Uh, so I'll move us forward. Thank you. And, and I'll move us forward. So um, what are some available policy levers that you see as particularly important or that are underutilized? I'm sorry, I did not share the order. How about if we start with Mark, then we'll go to Jillian and then Michael. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I'm thinking about what policies we would go after. And what I think about is, you know, I don't work for a public health uh, department. I work for the Office of Sustainability. We just work really, really closely with public health. I spent years trying to get them to be like the leaders of community climate resilience. And they were having a hard time understanding like what that actually means. And, and after a couple of years, I was, realized I was asking the wrong question. You know, ask not what your public health can do for you, ask what you can do for your local health departments. So I started to think about what other policies and other departments are looking at, and then how does that relate back to public health? And you know, there is that term like health in all policies. I don't think any other departments had ever thought of that. So when we talk to Austin Water, Austin Energy, our Parks Department, our Library Departments, they all have policies, they're all working on things, but they had never actually connected it back to public health. And I think that was sort of revolutionary for them because then they felt they could actually make a difference because now all these departments were making real decisions on people's lives that they could actually connect with. And that was sort of revolutionary. I talk about it very glowingly. Am, are we successful? Not so much, but you know, every once in a while, there's like a good policy that comes out maybe for Austin Water, looking at water uh, pricing in low-income communities. Maybe Austin Energy's got a new policy on health, on sorry, on weatherization but really making that extra effort to see what is that connection between this weatherization policy and the people's lives. And I think that is key, is connecting it to people's lives. Uh, I think it's a great question. I don't have a good answer. I have two brief reflections. One is that I think policy levers are critical because underlying this, this horrible intersection of environmental justice and equity is that all of the structural and systemic racism pieces are still there. 
So we have evidence base. We know what to do. We're doing it as fast as our small budgets and small staffs allow us. But policy reforms are needed because there's so many barriers that are beyond the level of government or strata that we work at, right? Um, so it's just more of a general observation. I don't know, I, there's lots of leaders hopefully addressing that. Um, the other thing else is the Clean Air Act itself is considered one of the most successful pieces of public health legislation in the 20th century, right? And there's a lot of good epi data that shows the impacts to communities of color and that there has been positive health benefits and reduced risk. And I often advocate that it's time for a Clean Indoor Air Act. And I won't try to unpack that at all because it's very complex from a regulatory and enforcement and a private property. That said, minimum safety thresholds for things like CO2 and particulates. Looking, ASHRAE standards for new construction are good, but I always argue that the millions of households that are already built that are going to take time for mitigation uh, and retrofit but that's at least setting safety thresholds for air exchange and PM as some EU and um, civic rim countries have done is, is a policy lever that we can start to really talk about. So that's my thoughts. This is a tough issue when it comes to policy. Um, it's, it's very, very complex, but what I will say is I would agree that we need to have a level playing field. Mm -hmm. What, we're, what we have now, and, and I think it has to start at the federal level. Um, you can't have one state um, not be allowed to use the word climate change. And then you have another state who is, you know, doing lots of things with um, addressing climate change. And so I think we need to, um, at the federal level, set the playing field so every state has a roadmap to the bare minimum standards, right? Last I checked, it's the United States of America. So let's try to level the playing field at the national level. That said, every state is different um, and they do have some autonomy and what happens say in Texas and what happens in Connecticut are very different and they, and they should have the flexibility to tailor fit. And then at the local level, we can do some tailor fitting too um, with, with policies. Um, I think where it really is hard is uh, when we look at environmental justice, when we look at um, um, vulnerable populations, communities that don't have the means. And in some of the communities I serve, um, we have extremes on both sides of the spectrum, folks that are, are, are doing well, that if their roof rips off their house or if their house gets leveled, they'll just build another one. Like, and, and I've heard communities say that, you know, I'll just build a new one. Most people don't have those means. Um, and then you have the other spectrum where, you know, we're dealing with it right now. Um, we have a heat wave going on and they can't afford air conditioners. Um, how can we get them um, and, and you can't say go to a cooling shelter. I mean, we can and we do, but is that, do you really like to sit back and think that people want to go to the library because it's too hot in their own home? Um, some people do it, but the average person doesn't want to do that. They want to be in their home where they, they feel, um, where they feel safe. And so we need to think about maybe policies to try to level the playing field. So we have the same basic standard of, of living. Um, you know, this, you know, you know, when we talk about equality, it's a, it's a very charred issue, uh, but we do need to do a better job. And I think it starts with policy. And I know our, here in Connecticut, our governor has put together a climate change committee, um, um, broken up into different subsections. And we have been going through this and policy statements are, being given to the municipalities, again, to try to set the level, level playing field and when we can uh, put some mandates in there, um, but, but like, we're being very careful about the mandates, right? Because that costs money, there are consequences for that too. Right, thank you all for your insights here. The importance of connecting policies to people's lives and health, having that at the center along with equity and justice at the center, but also celebrating successes like the Clean Air Act, 
what made this successful, um, learning lessons there, and then having a level playing field where across the board we know that there is a minimum standard of policies to protect health. Um, very, very insightful once more. And I think that feeds nicely into our next question. And I think this may be the last question that I ask you before opening it up to audience questions. We've already received a couple and I look forward to asking you those. Right before we get into those, how do we prioritize equity in this work and ensure that efforts to address climate impacts do not widen existing health and housing disparities? I did it again. Let's start with Jillian then Michael, and then Mark will round out these comments. I mean, it's the, it's the $20,000 question, and I, I wish I had something really valuable. I've worked with tribal communities for a long, long time and seen, again, systemic and structural racism play itself out in housing and healthcare and environmental exposures. Um, so the only two things I, I can really offer that I hope are of meaning is very practically at the public health level, and I actually did my dissertation around this, is public health coalitions are a space where you have agencies across different sectors and across different levels with community-based groups and organizers, and that's where that dialogue occurs. And we tend to underfund coalitions or a health department person is the chair and they're working, it becomes just a networking meeting as opposed to deep engagement across the, the, the communities that are impacted with the agencies. So on a very specific level, I think sustainable funding of co public health coalitions creates a forum where those most impacted are discussing it. I think fundamentally, and I don't know if this is, um, I'll just say it, I think academia needs a little shakeup. Um, I see a lot of data and scientific research being produced in volumes, but the amount of time they're actually measuring and testing and sampling data in the most vulnerable communities, it happens, but not as much as it should. So when we have this data set that drives regulations, drives policy, drives reform for equity, it doesn't necessarily capture, I think, some of the worst of the worst. And, and academia also gets a lot of the funding for research as opposed to the communities who are impacted themselves. So it's my little uh, editorial comment that I will um, close with there on the, on the equity question. Right. Let's start with funding um, because that's like, that is um, the, the elephant in the room when it comes to public health is we have been and continue to be underfunded. And then when we do get funding, we, we get grant funding where we throw money at a specific project, it has an end, and then all that good work goes away and it's not continued. And so we need to talk about real funding, core funding, um, and invest in our public health system. Um, COVID is a prime example. Uh, we didn't invest in public health. We can't say we didn't know about the pandemic. We knew it was coming. Um, but, and we, we did prepare, but we didn't take it to the next step. And so funding hands down uh, is, a, is, a, is a major issue. Putting the funding aside, um, I'm finishing up my PhD um, and I'm a researcher also. So I'm a public health official, I'm a researcher. And I've embraced citizen science, um, crowdsourced science, getting the community, getting the stakeholders involved. And every single research project I've done has resulted in a practical public health outcome or a policy change. Um, so it's not just research. And, and, and um, I love research, um, but, but we can't have research that doesn't go anywhere. It, it has to take it, it has to be taken to the next step. Um, and I think this is where academia can team up uh, with public health and other disciplines to not just do the study that's gonna sit on a bookcase and collect dust, but take it to the next step. Um, because there's a lot of good research out there, but it's not going anywhere. And, and that's where um, academia can team up with public health and move this forward. Um, so uh, citizen science, true citizen science, when you're involving um, your community, 
Um, and I'll be the first one to say, I mean, it's, it's not easy because now you have a whole bunch of other people you have to answer to. Um, but the breadth of knowledge that they have, the, they're, they're soldiers, they're warriors for our health department to help us get things done. They'll stand up in front of meetings, they'll write grants, they'll stand up to politicians where we can't sometimes. Um, they are our advocates, so citizen science um, and just good old fashioned community engagement. Because of the time, should we take a question and then potentially answer the equity question? I think that is a great idea. Thank you for, for volunteering that. Um, so we do have a couple good questions from the audience. We need to make sure that we get them into the discussion. Um, so actually, I will share all the questions now um, to give you an opportunity to, to answer uh, per your expertise, and then we'll turn it back to Niha. So here are the questions that we have. At what point in the climate emergency, thinking about um, recent COVID pandemic, do you think that it makes more sense to change the strategy for addressing these impacts, considering more mandates, government interventions, et cetera? And then here's another question. How do you see the connection between renters' rights and the issues of indoor air quality and extreme heat? Are there joint solutions that you see? So if you could just uh, quickly maybe answer one of those, that would be greatly appreciated. And I'll open it up to, we'll start with Mark. I'll try to answer both of them. Uh, for the first one, I mean, it's kind of dry, but never let a disaster go to waste. I mean, people always remember the last disaster and they always want to prepare for that. And I think it's hard for us to sort of shift that thinking. So we have to be able to, to leverage it and see if we can get funding and resources and people to help out. Uh, so for us, it was a winter storm. Right now it's heat. Who knows what's going to be in six months, but we have to be able to be quicker at responding. And then the second piece about renters' right, you know, the big elephant for us is that Austin is booming, right? And prices are going up, corporations are moving in, and people are getting squeezed out. And as much as we want to be able to invest in these communities, they're sort of feeling that they're getting pushed out. So how do we work with the community now to help them stay in place? And then how do we help future communities? Like how do we start to buy land outside the city so we can start to plan for future affordable housing? Because we're growing way too fast and don't have the ability to fix all the problems now. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you, Michael, for sharing your time, your expertise, and your wisdom in this conversation today. With that, I will turn it back over to Alyssa from NEHA to close out our webinar. Uh, thank you, Dr. DeJarnett, and thank you, panelists. Um, I think Anna had a few closing statements as well. I'll turn it over. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, again, thank you to our panelists, Mark Gillian and Michael, and thank you to Natasha for moderating for us. Um, also, thank you to our participants for joining us today and for your questions and for continuing the conversation. Um, in closing, I just wanted to point you to where you can find the resources that we've shared today um, and where the upcoming resources will be. Um, those will be on NCHH's Emergency Preparedness and Response webpage. And the bit.ly link is there on your screen. Um, go ahead, next slide. Next, um, I'm gonna turn it over to our colleague, Kristen Dorch from CDC for just some closing remarks. Go ahead, Kristen. Thank you, good afternoon. Thank you to our moderator, all of our panelists for this excellent discussion on why it's important um, to focus on housing and developing community preparedness and adaptations as it relates to climate change. Thank you to the team that has put together this series of webinars together over the last year at the National Center for Healthy Housing and the National Environmental Health Association. Um, one of our agency's goals within the National Center for Environmental Health is to strengthen our partnerships and relationships by working with multiple sectors to drive solutions, working with community leaders and members, and working across sectors in public and private partnerships. Our partnership with NCHH and NEHA is a valuable partnership in identifying needs where public, and health, public health and healthy housing professionals can assist 
and bridge gaps through creating resources, facilitating connections, or amplifying and disseminating information. Climate change is not an equal opportunity crisis, and those who are already experiencing health inequities are facing increased and compounded injustice from climate change. The conversations that we had today are opportunities to learn from organizations, which will help to achieve climate justice for all and minimize the health effects of climate change. So thank you all for joining today's webinar. We look forward to future discussions on climate and health, and Alyssa, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kristen. Um, again, I wanna thank our panelists, our moderator, as well as CDC and NCHH for making this webinar possible. Um, and for those of you interested in learning more about this topic, you can connect with NIHA and NCHH via the links on the slide. Again, the recording of the webinar will be made available on the NCHH YouTube channel. Um, and with that, uh, I'd like to thank all of our attendees so much for coming here today. Um, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you. <laughs>